Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you guys with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. Okay, happy Thursday, everybody. First up, Shanghai. Shanghai is open, yet community cases continue to be discovered, creating tremendous uncertainty for the residents of the megacity, as the risk of large-scale re-lockdowns remains very real. Local authorities have conducted several rounds of COVID testing in some neighborhoods with newly infected patients, and in the last few days, they have upgraded the risk level of 17 areas from low to medium, requiring residents there to stay at home for 14 days. While the case numbers remain low currently, what is concerning to health officials is that they are scattered across the city, posing a great challenge for authorities trying to figure out the transmission chains. Local authorities have expressed this week that to prevent another full-scale lockdown, Shanghai will employ regular nucleic acid testing, advanced surveillance technologies and big data, and highly localized lockdowns. The authorities call this revised strategy "zero COVID at the community level," but it is already encountering issues. For example, today, Thursday, we saw an escalation. Today, parts of Shanghai began imposing new lockdown restrictions, with residents of Minhang District, population 2.65 million, ordered to stay at home for two days in order to do nucleic acid tests for all residents this Saturday. While authorities are trying their best to balance zero COVID policies with the need to bring the economy back, how can there be business confidence in this environment? Indeed, this week, Alexander Hurst, senior policy analyst with the British Chamber of Commerce in China, expressed on the situation in Shanghai, "Quote: This unpredictability and increased risk is resulting in many businesses delaying, reducing, or withdrawing entirely from the Chinese market." End quote. Now, speaking of the Chinese market, let's move on to the Chinese economy. If you guys are enjoying the video, don't forget to hit the like button. And for anyone who wants to go the extra mile, as always, and help try and keep this channel sustainable, financially sustainable, Patreon, Buy Me a Coffee, and crypto links are in the description below. Thank you so much, everyone. People's Republic of China Premier Li Keqiang chaired the weekly executive meeting of the State Council, China's cabinet, yesterday, Wednesday, and once again, the top executive body stressed just how poor a shape the economy is in. With state media writing yesterday, "quote The meeting noted the still acute downward pressure facing the economy." End quote. There is now tremendous pressure on the premier to clean up the economic situation after Shanghai's two-month-long lockdown smashed an already shaky economy, dealing with a housing crisis which is still ongoing and other challenges. I appreciate that some may find it somewhat repetitive to discuss the poor state of the Chinese economy every day, but that is the reality in China currently, and so we will continue following it. The State Council readout focused on restoring logistics and once again stressed the importance of food security, which Beijing has been viewing with increased concern, expressing, "Quote: All summer grains must be harvested into granaries. Summer plowing taken forward smoothly, and supply of coal-fired power kept stable." To underpin price stability. Now, speaking of prices, the price of battery-grade lithium carbonate in China, which has seen a slowdown after skyrocketing growth last year, now has significant new tailwinds, in the short term at least, as local governments try to boost electric vehicle sales. Guangdong and Shanghai have rolled out incentives for people to trade in their old car for a new electric vehicle. Eight thousand to ten thousand RMB, respectively. The provinces of Hunan and Shandong have begun offering more modest subsidies of three thousand to eight thousand RMB for new electric vehicle purchases as well. Hu Junlong, the founder of ZE Consulting, speaking to domestic financial media, believes that car makers will stock up on batteries in the third quarter and then roll out new EVs in the fourth quarter. However, China International Capital Court Limited and Goldman Sachs both believe that over the longer term, the domestic lithium price will likely soften as China sees a domestic surplus over the next 12 to 36 months. Indeed, Goldman Sachs, in a May report, predicted a 70% year-on-year collapse in the global price of lithium in 2023. And while we're on cars, retail sales of passenger cars in China declined 17% in May from the same period a year ago, with over 1.35 million passenger vehicles being sold, according to the China Passenger Car Association. 
This number is up 30% month on month though, improving on April's terrible sales for the industry. Up next, according to a report published this week by the Institute of International Finance, IIF, that while there was a considerable portion of capital flows escaping China equities for most of the month, during the last week of May there were, quote, important inflows, end quote, which drove in a net inflow of 2.7 billion US dollars of funds into Chinese equities. The perspective for debt flows seem to be stabilizing, with China registering 2 billion of inflows, while emerging markets excluding debt showed 3.5 billion US dollars of outflows. An estimated 30.4 billion US dollars flowed out of China's bond market in February and March, mostly driven by market shocks to the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the resulting sanctions. Now, before we move on, I wanted to end part two on the economy with this editorial from domestic outlet Tyson Media, couched in the subtle language required for domestic criticism of national policy. The editors are pleading with policymakers to avoid yet another expensive infrastructure splurge. This is what they expressed. Despite the pressure to stabilize the economy, China should avoid irrational investments that were often seen in the past. Years of expansive infrastructure investment have put a limit on investment options, and its power to drive economic growth is on the decline. China should avoid investing in inefficient poor-performing infrastructure projects when there is a huge need for financial support for social security, education, and scientific research. In addition, whether government spending will empower or hamper private investment remains an issue that deserves serious consideration. Last up, the Chinese housing market. Sunic China Holdings Limited, China's fourth largest developer by sales, uh, which, like many, is facing a cash crunch, is seeking extra time to make payments on 2.3 billion yuan, 345 million US dollars of debt due next week, as the company cannot come up with the cash according to bondholders speaking to Chinese financial media today. The developer plans to extend repayments of an onshore bond due on the 13th of June by two years, but as of the filming of this, no agreement has been reached. In April, Sunex creditors allowed it to delay repayment of a 4 billion yuan onshore bond by 18 months, and in May, Sunex missed a 29.5 million US dollar coupon payment on a US dollar bond. Sunic is facing the same crisis many of its peers are, a liquidity crunch due to regulatory crackdowns, but even now with regulatory easing, the market has not returned, and in a recent filing, the company expressed, quote, since the beginning of 2022, the group's access to new financing has not been notably improved, end quote. And of course, due to the Evergrande crisis undermining household confidence, combined with the lockdowns, sales are in the toilet. Last week, Sunex said that its sales have plunged 59% year-on-year in the first five months of this year. No sales and no funding means that they cannot pay their debts. And according to Fitch Ratings Co., Sunic has 17 billion yuan in onshore and offshore capital market debt due this year alone. The fall of any of these massive developers risks triggering a wider systemic crisis, and Sunic is the fourth biggest in the country. The state will not permit a developer of this size to collapse, and thus, like it has with Evergrande and others, will likely step in. But the situation for the company is not good. We remember back in April, the company's Hong Kong shares were suspended from trading because it failed to publish its 2021 annual report. That is today's episode. Thank you so much, everybody. See you tomorrow.